Guns are one of the most controversial topics in America. They also have a pretty big impact on the health and safety of the country. Too often, we're afraid to talk about them because it's so sensitive. But we're gonna try and change that. We're going to talk about the history of guns in America, their role in homicide and suicide, and what we might do about all of it. Guns are the topic of this special series of Healthcare Triage. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And with that, the Second Amendment, America, and guns embarked on a long and strained history. We can forever argue about the original intent of the founders, but there's a pretty good case to be made that this amendment was put forward by James Madison as a compromise between Federalists, who liked the Constitution, and the Anti-Federalists, who supported power remaining with the states. The Second Amendment gave states more ability to form local militias, kind of like today's National Guard. Plus, let's remember that the United States had just fought the Revolutionary War. Allowing people to have guns and protecting that right ensured that the people would be able to resist tyrannical government in the future. While the Second Amendment's language is pretty straightforward, there's room for debate about its meaning. Some take the reference to a well-regulated militia to mean that the founders intended these rights to be applied strictly to the collective ability of states to organize groups who could carry guns. The federal government, much as they might like, can't tell states no or take away the militia's guns. Others believe the Second Amendment applies to individuals. This group interprets the amendment to mean that every single American has the right to have a gun and that the federal government can't get in the way of that. It took almost a century for the Supreme Court to weigh in on guns in the Second Amendment. In 1876, the Supreme Court heard U.S. versus Cruikshank, in which the Ku Klux Klan was preventing black citizens from buying guns. The court ruled that the Constitution did not give individuals the right to own guns and agreed that some citizens, in this case African Americans, could be prevented from doing so. A decade later, another case confirmed this by saying that states were welcome to restrict Americans' gun rights, just not the federal government. In 1894 in Miller v. Texas, the court weighed in on a case where a man sued Texas for prohibiting him from carrying a concealed weapon. The court again said the Second Amendment didn't apply to states. And again in 1939, another guy named Miller argued that the National Firearms Act, which prohibited sawed-off shotguns, violated the Constitution. The court disagreed. They said that because sawed-off shotguns weren't necessary to a well-regulated militia, the federal government was free to regulate them. This was a way of saying that the Second Amendment didn't apply to some guns. I hope it's clear at this point that for a long time in America, there was a tradition all the way to the Supreme Court of believing that the Second Amendment didn't mean that states or the federal government couldn't intervene with gun laws. They also believed that the amendment didn't apply to states and that it strictly applied to militias. Of course, just because the Supreme Court believes something doesn't mean all Americans do. They still argued about it. A lot. The Supreme Court didn't get involved again until 2008, though, in DC versus Heller. A police officer argued that the Capitol's ban on handguns was unconstitutional, and the court agreed. It ruled that there was an individual right to own guns and that it wasn't connected to militias. It didn't, however, weigh in on whether laws that prohibit certain people from owning guns are constitutional. Justice Antonin Scalia, who wrote the majority decision, wrote that the decision should not, and I'm quoting, be taken to cast doubt on longstanding prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. So there could still be lots of laws limiting gun ownership, but this was still the first real time the Supreme Court identified an individual's right to own a gun. A few years later, the court also found that Chicago didn't have the right to ban handgun ownership by individuals. And in 2016, the court ruled that Second Amendment applies to all guns, regardless of when they were invented. We here at Healthcare Triage are not legal experts, and we're not interested in telling you whether these cases were right or wrong. We just want to stress that the views of the court have evolved over time, and that Americans really really, really disagree about this. And they have for a long, long time. And guns have changed over time. Back when the Constitution was ratified, guns were all pretty much of the flintlock variety. Before those, you had to use a lid to cover the powder in a gun that would provide the power to launch a bullet. And that lid had to be moved by hand. The flintlock, on the other hand, 
sort of automated the process by pushing back the lid and creating the spark needed to ignite powder at the same time. This was a huge advance and remained the MO by which guns fired for centuries. The next modification was the creation of percussion cap guns. Instead of using flint and steel to ignite powder, sparks were created by a chemical, which was less likely to be unreliable in wet weather. Guns still needed to be reloaded between shots though, which made shooting multiple shots a pretty slow process, as you might imagine. This changed with the Colt revolver. It was mass produced and affordable and let you shoot five or six times before having to reload. An even bigger breakthrough was in the ammo though. Instead of powder and projectile being loaded separately, they were bundled together. The hammer needed only to strike the cap on the back of the ammo to send the projectile flying. Before the Civil War though, guns took a massive leap forward with the repeating carbine. First, it could breech load from the back of the barrel as opposed to muzzle loading from the front. Moreover, it could load seven bullets at a time, which could be fired in rapid succession. There's a story about Abraham Lincoln wanting this gun for the troops and his generals fighting him, because the thought of allowing men to fire seven shots at a time would mean a huge shortage of bullets. That's how little ammo there was at the time. The Gatling gun appeared in 1861, which was the first real machine gun. It could fire 200 rounds a minute, and it was operated by a hand crank. You had to cart it around on wheels though, and it wasn't light or small. Let's take a second and talk about semi-automatic and automatic guns. A repeating gun requires some manual action between shots to reload ammo and prep the next shot. A semi-automatic gun uses some mechanism, be it gas or recoil, to eject a spent cartridge and reload the next shot each time a trigger is pulled. A gun that keeps firing each time you pull the trigger with no other effort is a semi-automatic gun. An automatic gun, on the other hand, will keep shooting, ejecting spent cartridges, reloading the next bullet, and firing for as long as you hold down the trigger. Or as long as you have ammo. Machine guns are automatic weapons. Most handguns you think of today, and many rifles, are semi-automatic. One pull, one shot. Over the next century, most of the changes made to guns involved the size of the projectile, the number of bullets that could be loaded at a time, and the shape of the gun. What matters is reliability, stopping power, and how many shots you want to fire before you have to reload. The one thing worth touching on here at the beginning is, of course, the assault rifle. It gets a lot of attention in the press. Machine guns, like the M4A1, are fully automatic and can fire up to 950 rounds per minute. Sale of these guns was banned in 1986. The AR-15, on the other hand, may look similar, but only fires one round per trigger pull. It's semi-automatic. The AR-15 looks scary, of course, and it's an assault rifle, but it fires just as fast as any semi-automatic pistol. So what makes it an assault rifle? Banned assault rifles have collapsible stocks, flash hiders, and pistol grips. They also have magazines with more than 10 rounds. After the 1994 assault weapons ban, gun makers started to modify rifles slightly to make them legal. The High Point 995, for instance, was sold with a 10-round mag. It was used in the Columbine Massacre. There are reasons why the AR-15 is popular. It's reliable. Gun owners know it's unlikely to jam, either for hunting or defense. It's really flexible and adaptable, and there are tons of modifications you can make to it for different uses. If you like guns, it's a really useful gun. It's also not the real focus of our gun problem. It's an easy target, but it's not how most gun deaths occur. How do they and in what setting? That's the topic of next week's healthcare triage.